a lot of lessons can be learned from the first licensed dengue vaccine. Um, it's an incredibly complex vaccine, and I will definitely not do justice to this vaccine in the limited amount of 11 to 15 minutes. And so I hope that some of your questions uh, later on in the discussion will then address uh, those most pertinent issues to you, because I will not be able to address all today. So the first question, do we need a dengue vaccine? The disease burden um, um, cries indeed uh, for a vaccine, and you've already heard enough arguments uh, about an incredibly um, a high, high burden, but also uh, the dengue is poised to increase. And I, and I agree with the speakers earlier on that Africa is on the brink of also seeing major beta dengue outbreaks. In the moment, the main burden is still in Southeast Africa. Um, so there are four um, endogenically distinct serotypes, um, and each of them can cause a whole um, range of clinical manifestations with really most of them having very mild or even asymptomatic disease. And the peculiarities of dengue, as you know, it is really the number of infections that will modulate the severity of your disease. And uh, so with a primary uh, infection uh, causing from anything to asymptomatic to severe, but it's really the second infection with a different serotype that, will, that has an, um, a higher risk of, of more severe disease. Interestingly, again, it's also important for our understanding later is that from natural cohort studies, we actually know that the third and fourth infection then are actually associated with a lower risk of severe dengue. We've also heard that dengue, if managed well clinically, should have an extremely low case fatality rate. So the reason really for a dengue vaccine is not so much mortality, but it's driven by the extremely high numbers of hospitalizations that overwhelm already fragile healthcare systems. So what makes dengue vaccine development so difficult? And if you understand this figure, you've understood most of the issues. So I'll, bring, I'll quickly bring you through this. So basically the first dengue infection of, with any of the serotypes will cause homotypic, lifelong, solid immunity against that serotype. But interesting, at the same time, when you have that infection, you also get, uh, you also trigger um, cross-vective heterotypic antibodies to the other uh, serotypes. And that, that initially gives you protection against that other serotype. But then, over time, when these antibody levels off to the other uh, serotypes wane, at that time, your risk of enhanced disease increases. So it's really a matter of time, and the, and the a title here, shorter time interval between the first and second infections associated with protection. But from year three onward, or even a second year onward, when these antibody titers wane, you will have higher risk. So these heterotypic antibodies can both be protective as well as enhancing, depending on the timing between these, these infections, but also depending on the antibody titers. If you understand this, you understand the complexities later of, of, the, of, of what we see with the first dengue vaccine. But what I also want to show here, if you do measure then the antibodies in the, um, in the standard um, method, which is called plaque reduction uh, uh, neutralization assay, you will see, even after infection with one, for at least a certain time, you will have a positive PRNT to at least two or three or four other serotypes that may false, uh, that then may lead to false misinterpretations. So really, it's the immunological interaction between these, between the four serotypes that make dengue vaccine development so difficult. So now, finally, after 50 years of development, 50 years of development, we finally do have three leading dengue vaccine uh, candidates. And, um, and they are pretty similar. They're all live attenuated vaccines, and all three of them uh, use some kind of chimerization. And chimerization is 
into another background of the non-structural proteins. And for, for the first licensed vaccine, Sanofi Pasteur's vaccine, it is a yellow fever backbone. For the Takeda vaccine, they're using a dengue serotype 2 backbone. And for the um, Butantan or the NIH-developed uh, uh, vaccine, they, they actually have three full genomic viruses. But for serotype 2, they use the dengue serotype 4 backbone. So of these three leading candidates, as we said, the first vaccine, um, Dengvaxia, was first licensed in 2015. Takeda um, will um, soon release their phase three trial results from the first 12 months. And uh, Butantan is still doing in the process of doing their phase three trials and will probably release their results only in 2020. So let's now focus on the results of Dengvaxia. So in the initial phase two trials, the immunogenicity uh, uh, looked very promising. It, if you really look at this, it looks quite tetravalent and a very good response. And these promising results were convinced or led the, the company at the time to not only um, um, go into their phase three trials, but also in parallel already develop the manufacturing capabilities. Unfortunately, this uh, relatively tetravalent homogeneous response seen in the PRNT did not translate into a homogeneous vaccine efficacy against all fair four serotypes. And again, now in hindsight, it's also because the PRNT, the results are misleading because in the PRNT you will have homotypic as well as heterotypic antibodies. Anyway, so the vaccine efficacy varied depending on serotype, um, severity disease and age. There were also some initial hints that it may vary with serostatus. But because the numbers, uh, because not blood samples were not taken from all uh, trial participants, one could not conclusively answer that question. So meanwhile, Sanofi Pasteur has come out with additional retrospective analyses to stratify this, the vaccine performance by serostatus. And so this is very important to let you know because it's not the Philippines that came out with these uh, additional um, adverse events, it was really based on Sanofi Pasteur's retrospective analyses. So because they did not have blood samples at baseline, um, they then took blood samples done on, on month 13 to retrospectively determine um, the vaccine performance based on whether an individual is seronegative or seropositive. I do not have the time to show all the data, but I think this figure really shows us best. And three lessons can be learned. And I think First of all, if you look at the placebo, so unvaccinated people, you see the cumulative incidence of dengue. And clearly, if you have had a primary infection before, you have a higher risk compared to seronegative. Seronegative is someone who's never had dengue before. So clearly, this study also underpins that, that seropositives have a higher risk. Second lesson here is, if you are a seropositive and you are vaccinated, um, you have much, uh, you have protection uh, inferred by the vaccine. So this is the seropositive vaccinated who now has reduced cumulative incidence versus the seropositive unvaccinated. So clearly the vaccine works. But a seronegative um, unvaccinated person who is now here, this is the blue continuous line, you can see that the seronegative vaccinated person now has an excess risk of severe dengue or hospitalized dengue. So in other words, this vaccine performs differently um, in seronegatives versus seropositives. And um, there's a long, difficult explanation, I think, for the sake of time. It's almost impossible to go through this. But basically, what is thought is that this vaccine uh, has a silent infection, um, and, then, and basically that then a seronegative person who's now vaccinated uh, will now have a secondary-like infection when that person gets the true uh, wild-type infection. So basically, what happens is that the vaccinated seronegative person now, epidemiologically and clinically, behaves similar to a seropositive unvaccinated person. 
It's not a higher risk, it's a similar risk than a seropositive person. So basically, Dengvexia is shown to be efficacious and safe in seropositive persons, but it increases the risk of severe dengue in seronegative people. With this very complex vaccine, how then should WHO advise how best to use this vaccine in the absence of other vaccines in the moment and the, and the absence also of any truly effective, sustainable and scalable vector control measures. So if you look at the public health benefit, clearly the benefit will depend on the underlying seroprevalence rates. And so the underlying seroprevalence in high endemic areas by the age of nine is around 70%. And if you then, if you then calculate in a court of 1 million vaccinees, 5,600 cases of hospitalized severe, of hospitalized dengue can be prevented in seropositives, but to induce uh, about 500 cases in seronegatives. So how do you then roll out this vaccine? And at WHO, we considered various options and took into consideration the very complex discussions about population benefit versus individual risk, all the ethical considerations, the country's risk perceptions and communication issues, all the feasibility issues of screening tests versus population serial surveys, programmatic issues, and how do you best achieve high vaccine coverage rates. And we came down to evaluating a, still a population seroprevalence criteria, so where you only give the vaccine in extremely high seroprevalence settings of 80% and above, or whether you would do individual screening for whether you're seropositive or seronegative and then only vaccinate those who are seropositive. A long story, I'll make it short, for countries really considering WHO feels that the best uh, strategy would to be to do individual screening. And that is because this population is technically now identifiable and I think we're ethically and morally obliged to minimize the risk. So this vaccination uh, strategy is now uh, the recommended strategy, but as you can imagine, this, this um, a pre vaccination screening strategy has a lot of uh, programmatic challenges, also communication challenges, um, challenges with having, identifying the best screening test that has a good profile between uh, sensitivity and specificity. Um, so there are now a whole range of other issues, and we recently had a big workshop with all country representatives to think through how to implement such a pre-vaccination screening strategy. The second generation dengue vaccines are coming up, and, you know, and so lots of countries have said, well, we just wait and see how the second generation vaccines will perform, and I think that's fair enough. So just to remind you, dengue vaccine needs three doses, Takeda two doses, and Budatan only one dose. The strength of the Budantan is that we probably have learned that you do need non-structural proteins for good protection, and the Budatan vaccine has a much higher proportion of dengue-related proteins, which make it more likely that it does not only induce humoral, but also cellular immunity. The, the advantage of Takeda is that they have at least one of the, of these, of the dengue serotypes as backbone, and therefore also making it more likely, we have not seen the published data yet, making it more likely that it will be more efficacious than Dengvexia. So lessons learned is, we've learned from the Philippine situation, but not only from that situation, that you need a well-planned communication uh, plan around any vaccine introduction. This is particularly true for vaccines with partial efficacy. And all of our current new vaccines, be it malaria, maybe HIV, um, all vaccines that are currently coming up have partial efficacy and are much more difficult to communicate to the public. Uh, we also learned some very practical lessons that blood samples need to be taken from all participants so that a priori plans can be done to analyze the data by serostatus and both Takeda and Budantan are doing this. A follow-up for a longer time to assess a late onset of vaccine enhancement um, is, 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 was, was recommended by WHO already for many, many years and indeed all three companies uh, are doing this and have done that for their vaccines. I think we need to be intellectually prepared that we may never find a perfect dengue vaccine. 
That's, and so part of all the thinking that we're now going through is also to preparing the world how we, how we um, best use um, um, and maybe not so perfect dengue vaccine that we will have in the future or that we have now. Rigorous risk benefit assessments need to be established, communication strategies developed, and for the time being, uh, my last sentence is we only have one vaccine in the moment, um, and for, the, for this vaccine we have to do pre-vaccination screening strategy if you want to consider this vaccine. Thank you so much. <laughs>